everyone, I am Arkamovich, and today I'm going to be reading you a bedtime story. I'm going to be reading Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wayne Jones. Chapter 1, in which Sophie talks to hats. In the land of Inquiry, where such things as seven league boots and cloaks of invisibility really exist, it's quite a misfortune to be born the eldest of three. Everyone knows you are the one who will fail first and worst if the three of you set out to seek your fortunes. Sophie Adder was the eldest of three sisters. She was not even born the child of a poor woodcutter, which might have given her some chance of success. Her parents were well-to-do and kept a lady hat shop in the prosperous town of a market shipping. True, her own mother died when Sophie was just two years old and her sister Letty was one year old, and their father married the youngest shop assistant, a pretty blonde girl named Fanny. Fanny shortly gave birth to a third sister, Martha. This ought to made Sophie and Letty into ugly sisters, but in fact, all three girls grew up very pretty indeed. Although Letty was the one everyone said was the most beautiful, Fanny treated all three girls the same kindness and did not favor Martha in the least. Mr. Howder was proud of his three daughters and sent them all to the best schools in town. Sophie was the most studious. She read a great deal and soon realized how little chance she had of an interesting future. It was a disappointment to her, but she was still happy enough looking after her sisters and grooming Martha to seek her fortune when the time came. Since Fanny was always busy in the hat shop, Sophie was the one to look after the younger two. There was a certain amount of screaming and hair pulling between the younger two. Letty was by no means resigned to be the one who, next to Sophie, was bound to be the least successful. It's not fair, Letty would shout. Why should Martha have the best just because she was born the youngest? I shall marry a prince, so there. To which Martha would retort that she would end up being disgustingly rich without having to marry anybody. Then Sophie would have to drag them apart and mend their clothes. She was very deft with her needle. As time went on, she made clothes for her sister too. There is one deep rose outfit she made for Letty the main day before the story really starts, which Fanny said looked as if it had come from the most expensive shop in Kingsbury. By this time, everyone began talking about the Witch of the Waste again. It was that the witch had threatened the life of the king's daughter, and that the king had commanded his personal magician, Wizard Solomon, to go into the waste to deal with the witch. It seemed that Wizard Solomon had not only failed to deal with the witch, but had got himself killed by her. So in a few months after that, a tall black castle suddenly appeared on the hills above market shipping, blowing clouds of smoke from its four tall, thin turrets. Everyone was fairly sure the witch had moved out of the waste again, and was about to terrorize the country the way she used to fifty years ago. People got very scared indeed. Nobody went out alone, particularly at night. What made it all the scarier was the castle did not stay in the same place. Sometimes it was a tall black smudge on the moors in the northwest, sometimes it reared above the rocks to the east, and sometimes it came right down the hill to sit on the heather only just beyond the last farm to the north. You could see it actually moving sometimes with smoke pouring out from the turrets and dirty gray gusts. For a while, everyone was certain that the castle would come right down into the valley before long. The mayor talked of sending the king for help, but the castle stayed roving about the hills, and it was learned that it did not belong to the witch, but to Wizard Howl. Wizard Howl was bad enough. Though he did not seem to want to leave the hills, he was known to amuse himself by collecting young girls and sucking their souls from them. Or some people said he ate their hearts. He was utterly cold-blooded and heartless wizard, and no young girl was safe from him if he caught her on their own. Sophie, Letty, and Martha, along with the other girls in market shipping, were warned never to go out alone, which was a great annoyance to them. They wondered what use Wizard Howell found for all the souls he collected. They had other things in their mind before long, however, for Mr. Hatter died suddenly just as Sophie was old enough to leave school for good. Then it appeared that Mr. Hatter had been altogether too proud of his daughters. School fees. 
fees he had been paying for had left the shop quite heavy debts. When the funeral was over, Fanny sat down in the parlor next door to the shop and explained the situation. You'll all have to leave that school, I'm afraid, she said. I've been doing the sums back and front and sideways, and the only way I could keep the business going and take care of the three of you is to see you all settled into a promising apprenticeship somewhere. It isn't practical to have you all in the shop. I can't afford it. So this is what I've decided. Letty first. Letty looked up, glowing in health and beauty, which even sorrow and black ghosts could not hide. I want to go on learning, she said. And so you shall love, said Fanny. I've arranged for you to be an apprentice at Azari's, a pastry cook in Market Square. They have a name for treating their learned like kings and queens, and you should be very happy there, as well as learn useful trade. Mrs. Sari is a good customer and a good friend. She has agreed to squeeze you in as a favor. Letty laughed in a way that showed she was not at all pleased. Well, thank you, she said. Isn't it lucky that I like cooking? Fanny looked relieved. Letty could be awkwardly strong-minded. Now, Martha, she said, I know you're full young to go out and work, so I've thought around for something that would give you a long, quiet apprenticeship and go on being useful to you whenever you decide to do that. You know my old school friend, Annabelle Fairfax? Martha, who was slender and fair, fixed her big gray eyes on Fanny, almost as strong-minded as Letty. You mean the one who talks such a lot, she said. Isn't she a witch? Yes, with a lovely house and clients all over a folding valley, Fanny said eagerly. She's a good woman, Martha. She'll teach you all she knows, and very likely introduce you to grand people she knows in Kingsbury. You'll be set up in life when she's done with you. She's a nice lady, Martha conceded. All right. Sophie, listening, felt that Fanny had worked everything out just as it should be. Letty, as the second daughter, was never likely to come to much, so Fanny had put her where she might meet a handsome young apprentice and live happily ever after. Martha, who was bound to strike out and make her fortune, would have witchcraft and rich friends to help her. As for Sophie herself, Sophie had no doubt what was coming, and it did not surprise her when Fanny said, Now, Sophie, dear, it seems only right that just you should inherit the hat shop when I retire, being the eldest as you are. So I've decided to take you on as apprentice myself, to give you a chance to learn the trade. How do you feel about that? Sophie could hardly say that she simply felt resigned to the hat trade. She thanked Fanny gratefully. So that settled it then, Fanny said. The next day, Sophie helped Martha pack her clothes in a box, and on the coming after, they all saw her off on the carrier's cart, looking small and upright and nervous. For the way to upper folding, where Mrs. Fairfax lives, was over the hill past Wizard Howell's castle. Martha was understandably scared. She'll be all right, said Letty. Letty refused all the help with the packing. When the carrier cart was out of sight, Letty crammed all of her possessions into a pillowcase and paid the neighbor's boot boy sixpence to wheel in a wheelbarrow to Cesare's in Market Square. Letty marched behind the wheelbarrow, looking much more cheerful than Sophie expected. Indeed, she had an air of shaking the dust off the hat shop off her feet. The poop boy brought back a scribbled note from Letty saying she had put her things in the girls' dormitory, and Cesaria seemed great fun. A week later, a carrier brought a letter from Martha to say that Martha had arrived safely at Mrs. Fairfax, and was a great dear who uses honey in everything. She keeps peace. That was all Sophie heard of her sisters for quite a while, because she started her own apprenticeship the day Martha and Letty left. Sophie, of course, knew that trade quite well already. Since she was a tiny child, she had run in and out of the big work shed across the yard where the hats were damped and molded on blocks, and flowers and fruits and other trimmings were made from wax and silk. She knew the people who worked there. Most of them had been there when her father was a boy. She knew Bessie, the only remaining work assistant. She knew the customers who bought the hats and the man who drove the cart, which fetched the raw straw hats from the country to be shaped on the blocks in the shed. She knew the other suppliers, and now you made felt for winter hats. There is not really much that Fanny could teach her except perhaps the best way to get a customer to buy a hat. You lead up to the right hat 
left and he said show them ones that won't quite do it first so they know the difference as soon as they put the right one on in fact sophie did not sell hats very much after a day of so of observing the work shed and another day of going around the clothier and silk merchants with fanny fanny set her to trimming hats Sophie sat in a small alcove in the back of the shop, sewing roses to bonnets and veils to velours, lining them with silk and rearranging wax fruit and ribbon stylishly on the outside. She was good at it. She quite liked doing it, but she felt isolated and a little dull. The workshop people were too old to be much fun, and besides, they treated her as someone apart from who was going to inherit the business someday. Bessie treated her the same way. Bessie's only talk away. Bessie's only talk anyway was about the farmer she was going to marry the week after May Day. Sophie rather envy Fanny, who could bustle off with a bargain with the silk merchant whenever she wanted. The most interesting thing was the talk from the customers. Nobody can buy a hat without gossip. Sophie sat in her alcove and stitched and heard about the mayor, who wouldn't eat green vegetables. And the wizard house castle had moved around the cliffs again. Really, that man, whisper, whisper, whisper. The voices always dropped low when they talked of Wizard Owl. But Sophie gathered that he caught the girls down in the valley last month. Bluebeard, one whispered. And then voices became again. To say Jane Ferrier was a perfect disgrace the way she did her hair. That was one who would never attract even Wizard Owl, let alone a respectable man. Then there would be fleeting, fearful whisper of the Witch of the Waste. Sophie began to feel the Wizard Owl and the Witch of the Waste get together. They seemed to be made for one another. Someone ought to arrange that, she remarked to a hat she was trimming at the moment. But by the end of the month, the gossip in the shop suddenly all about Letty. Cesare, as it seems, was packed with gentlemen from morning to night, each one buying quantities of cake demanding to be served by Letty. She had had ten proposals of marriage, ranging in quality from the mayor's son to the lad who swept the streets. She had refused them all, saying she was too young to make up her mind yet. I call that sensible of her, Sophie said to a bonnet, as she was pleading silks and dew. Fanny was pleased with the news. I knew she'd be all right, she said happily. It occurred to Sophie that Fanny was glad Letty was no longer around. Letty's bad for custom, she told the bonnet, pleading away a mushroom-colored silk. She would make even you look glamorous, you dowdy old thing. Other ladies looked at Letty in despair. Sophie talked to hats more and more as the weeks went by. There was no one much else to talk to. Fanny was out bargaining or trying to whip up customs much of the day, and Bessie was busy serving and telling everyone her wedding plans. Sophie got into the habit of putting each hat in a stand as she finished it where it sat looking almost like a head without a body, and pausing while she told the hat what the body under it ought to be like. She flattered the hats a bit because you should flatter customers. You have a mysterious allure, she told one that all veiling with hidden twinkles to a wide creamy hat with roses under the brim, she said. You're going to have to marry money. And to a caterpillar straw green with curly green feathers, she said. You're young as a spring leaf. She told the pink bonnet they had dimpled charm and smart hats trimmed with velvet they were witty. She told the mushroom pleated bonnie, you have a heart of gold and someone in high precision will see it and fall in love with you. This was because she felt sorry for that particular bonnet. It looked so fussy and plain. Jane Ferrier came into the shop the next day and bought it. Her hair did look a little strange, Sophie thought, peering from her alcove, as if Jane had wound it around a row of pokers. It seemed a pity she had chosen that bonnet, but everyone seemed to be buying hats and bonnets around then. Maybe it was Fanny's sale stock, or maybe it was spring coming on, but that trait was definitely picking up. Fanny began to say a little guiltily, I think I shouldn't have been such a hurry to place more than Letty. At this rate, we might have managed. There was so much customs as April drew towards May Day that Sophie had to put on a demure gray dress and help in the shop too, but such was demanded that she was hard at trimming hats between customers, and every evening she took them next door to the house where she worked by lamplight far into the night in order to have hats to sell the next day. 
caterpillar green hats like the one the mayor's wife had were much called for. So were pink bonnets. Then the week before May Day, someone came in and asked for mushroom pleats like the one Jane Ferrier had been wearing when she ran off with the Count of Cataract. That night she sewed. Sophie admitted to herself that her life was rather dull. Instead of talking to Hat, she tried each one on as she finished it and looked in the mirror. It was a mistake. The gray dress did not suit Sophie particularly, and her eyes were red rimmed with sewing. And since her hair was reddish straw color, neither did the caterpillar green nor the pink. The one with the mushroom pleats simply made her look dreary, like an old maid, said Sophie. Not that she wanted to raise off with counts like Jane Ferrier, or even fancied half the town offering her marriage, like Letty. But she wanted to do something. She was not sure what. That had a bit more interest to do than simply trimming hats. She thought she would find time the next day to go talk to Letty. But she did not go. Either she could not find the time, or she could not find the energy, or it seemed a great distance to Market Square, or she remembered that she was on her own was endangered from Wizard Owl. Anyway, every day it seemed more difficult to go. It was very odd. Sophie had always thought she was nearly as strong-minded as Letty, but now she was finding that there was something she could only do when there was no excuses left. This is absurd, said Sophie. Market Square is only two streets away. If I run, and she swore to herself she would go around to Cesare's when the hat shop closed for May Day. Meanwhile, a piece of gossip came into the shop. The king had quarreled with his own brother, Prince Justin. It was said the prince had gone into exile. Nobody quite knew the reason for the quarrel, but the prince had actually come through market shipping in disguise a couple of months back, and nobody had known. The Count of Cataract had been sent by the king to look for the prince when he happened upon Jane Ferrier instead. Sophie listened and felt sad. Interesting things seemed to happen, but always to somebody else. Still, it would be nice to see Letty. May Day came. Merrymaking filled the streets from dawn onwards. Fanny went out early, but Sophie had a couple of hats to finish first. Sophie sang as she worked. After all, Letty was working too. Cesare's was open till midnight on holidays. I shall buy one of their cream cakes, Sophie decided. I haven't had one for ages. She watched people crowding past the window in all kinds of bright clothes, people selling souvenirs, people walking on stilts, and she felt really excited. But when at last she put the gray shawl over her gray dress and went into the street, Sophie did not feel excited. She felt overwhelmed. There were too many people rushing past, laughing and shouting. Far too much noise and jostling. Sophie felt as the past months of sitting and sewing had turned her into an old woman or a semi-invalid. She gathered her shawl around her and crept along, close to the houses, trying to avoid being trodden by people's best shoes or jabbed in the elbows and trailing silk. When there suddenly came a volley of bangs from overhead somewhere, Sophie thought she was going to faint. She looked up and saw Wizard Owl's castle right down on the hillside above the town. So near, it seemed to be sitting on the chimneys. Blue flames were shooting out all four of the castle turrets, bringing balls of blue fire with them that exploded high into the sky quite horrendously. Wizard Owl seemed to be offended by May Day, or maybe he was trying to join in in his own fashion. Sophie was terrified to care. She would have gone home, except she was halfway to Cesare's by then, so she ran. What made me think I wanted life to be interesting, she asked as she ran. I'd be far too scared, comes from being the eldest of three. When she reached the market square, it was worse, if possible. Most of the inns were in the square, crowds of young men swaggering purely to and fro, trailing cloaks and long sleeves and stamping their buckled boots. They never would have dreamed of wearing on a working day, calling loud remarks and accosting girls. The girls strolled in fine pairs ready to be accosted. It was perfectly normal for May Day, but Sophie was scared of that too. When a young man in a fantastical blue and silver costume spotted Sophie and decided to accost her as well, Sophie shrank into a shop doorway to try to hide. The young man looked at her in surprise. It's all right, you little gray mouse, he said, laughing rather pityingly. I only want to buy you a drink. Don't look so scared. The pitying look made Sophie utterly ashamed. He was such a dashing specimen, too, with a bony, sophisticated face. Really quite old, well into his twenties, elaborate blonde hair. His sleeves trailed longer. 
than any in the square. All scalloped edges and silver inlays. Oh no, thank you, if you please, sir. Sophie stammered. I'm on my way to see my sister. Then by all means do so, laughed this advanced young man. Who am I to keep a pretty lady from her sister? Would you like me to go with you since you seem so scared? He meant it kindly, which made Sophie more ashamed than ever. No, no thank you, sir. She gasped and fled past him. He wore perfume, too. The smell of hyacinths followed her as she ran. What a courtly person, Sophie thought as she pushed her way between the two tables outside of Cesare's. Inside was packed and noisy as the square. Sophie located Letty among the line of assistants at the counter because a group of evident farmer sons leaning their elbows onto it shouting remarks to her. Letty, prettier than ever, perhaps a little thinner, was putting cakes in bags as fast as she could, giving each bag a deft little twist and looking back under her elbow with a smile for an answer for each bag she twisted. There was a great deal of laughter. Sophie had to fight her way through to the counter. Letty saw her. She looked shaken for a moment, then her eyes and smile widened and shouted, Sophie! Can I talk to you? Sophie yelled. Somewhere, she shouted a little helplessly as a large, well-dressed elbow jostled her back from the counter. Just a moment, Letty screamed back. She turned to the girl next to her and whispered. The girl nodded and grinned and came into Letty's place. You'll have to have me instead, she said to the crowd who was next. But I want to talk to you, Letty, one of the farmer's son yelled. Talk to Carrie, Letty said. I want to talk to my sister. Nobody really seemed to mind. They jostled Sophie along to the edge of the counter where Letty held up a flap and beckoned her and told her not to keep Letty all day. When Sophie had edged the flap, Letty seized her by her wrist and dragged her into the back of the shop. Two rooms surrounded by a rack upon wooden rack, each one filled with rows of cake. Letty pulled forward two stools. Sit down, she said. She looked at the nearest rack in an absent-minded way and handed Sophie a cream cake out of it. You may need this, she said. She sank onto a stool, breathed the rich smell of cakes in, feeling a little tearful. Oh, Letty, I'm so glad to see you. Yes, I'm glad you're sitting down, said Letty. You see, I'm not Letty, I'm Martha. And that is the end of chapter one. This is just something I'm trying out. If you enjoyed this, please let me know down in the comments below, or give this video a like, and let me know if you want me to continue reading with chapter two. But thank you guys for uh, joining me for chapter one. This is my favorite novel, uh, and I look forward to reading it uh, more in the future. <laughs> so have yourselves a wonderful day or night or whatever time it is, and I'll see you guys later.